friends, uh, guests. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <clears throat> it's a, a real honor and a privilege to be here tonight. Um, many will know that uh, this is where I completed all my education. Um, my undergraduate degree was from just across the road. Did my master's here, and recently I completed my PhD here as well. <clears throat> this place is, of course, more important and better known than educating the son of a farmer from the backwaters of present-day Bangladesh. Amongst other notes of fame, this place is, of course, a significant reference point in our popular culture. <clears throat> Apart from many films being filmed here, <clears throat> those uh, that know their English literature, who have read George Orwell <clears throat> and his dystopian novel, 1984, will know that this is represented in that novel as the Ministry of Information. We are, of course, in one of the most important rooms of this building, the Ministry of Information. I'm not sure what this means and what it says about our proceedings here tonight. That said, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight <clears throat> and to chair this inaugural professoral lecture by Professor, or some of us know him as Sheikh Abdullah Kim Murad, recently appointed the Aziz Foundation Professor of Islamic Studies. I'd like to say just two things before I introduce Professor Abdul Hakim tonight. <clears throat> Firstly, something about the Aziz Foundation after which this professorship is named. The Aziz Foundation is the sponsor and the funder of this professorship. The Aziz Foundation is a very visionary family charitable foundation funded by a very visionary family who have been involved in philanthropic work for generations now. And I'm very, very pleased that tonight with us we have Brother Asif Aziz, who's been the inspiration behind and the founder of the Aziz Foundation. The Aziz Foundation is seeking to be a model for Muslim family charitable foundations within the UK. There was a time when we envied the likes of organizations like the Red Cross and Christian Aid. As a child, I would often ask, why cannot we Muslims have similar organizations like that? Well, we have them now. We have Islamic Relief, we have Muslim Aid, we have Penny Appeal, National Zakat Foundations, and I'm told that there are more than 100 charity organizations like that here in the UK, doing wonderful things across the world. As a teenager, as a young adult, I looked at organizations and often envied organizations like the Joseph Rowntree and Barrow Cadbury Trust. And I often asked, why can't we Muslims have foundations like that? Well, it's happening now. We have the Aziz Foundation. We have the Rendiri Charitable Trust, which is represented here tonight. We have Kasarov. We have Safiri Foundation, all of whom are represented here tonight. The Aziz Foundation has led the way in building such family foundations. I've been honored to lead some of that work over the last four years. I come to the end of my stint at the Aziz Foundation at the end of this month, so I'm particularly pleased to be able to chair this event tonight. The Aziz Foundation is a grant-making foundation, but it is a lot more than that. It is also a development organization. It takes, key, it takes interest in key issues in Muslim communities. And one of those issues is the development of a Muslim leadership, development of Muslim leaders here in the UK. And one area of that leadership is development of uh, Muslim faith leaders and parallel to that, development of Muslim institutions to produce those faith leaders. Muslim institutions involved in higher education, and the production of the leadership for the future. So the second thing that I wanted to say was a little bit about the Muslim Leadership Development Program, a program 
that's been developed at the Aziz Foundation over the last three to four years. It started off with a reflection on an advert some of you will have seen circulated in Muslim communities. The advert is for an imam in an Ottoman mosque. And the advert seeks an imam who knows religious sciences, but also knows the human and physical sciences. An imam who is good looking and has good recitation. An imam who is sporty and fit, i.e. an imam who is an all-rounder faith leaders who are all-rounders. Again, as a young man, I used to look at bishops and rabbis in this country and how they spoke on televisions. Later on, I would look at people like Rowan Williams and Jonathan Sachs, and again, ask myself the question, why can we Muslims not have faith leaders like that? Faith leaders who are able to marry the religious sciences with the human and social sciences, who are able to speak to the nation, make sense to the nation, make sense of the issues facing the nation. So it was only natural that when I started at the Aziz Foundation, I took a particular interest <clears throat> in this faith leadership development program, or Muslim leadership development program. The Aziz Foundation was fully behind this program, and I'm very, very pleased that the family was so firmly behind this program. Asif Bay came with us to meet uh, Sheikh Abdullah K. Murad at uh, uh, Cambridge Muslim College. I should say something about Asif, but he doesn't go, he doesn't, doesn't travel very far from his office. Um, but for him to go all the way to uh, Cambridge Muslim College, his father came with us to Ibrahim College, uh, is a signal of the importance that the family placed uh, in this program, Muslim Leadership Development Program, uh, by visiting these institutions. And the amount of money they have committed to this program is the largest within the Aziz Foundation. So it's a very significant commitment, and it shows the importance that the family places behind this program. The program seeks to develop leaders who have an understanding, a deep understanding of the Islamic faith but also a deep understanding of society. It's a program that seeks to produce Muslims, whether in the secular public sphere or the community sphere or the religious sphere, that can take our communities to a better place. But to produce such leaders requires a lot of thinking. To produce such leaders requires institution fit for purpose. And it is for this reason that the Aziz Foundation appointed a professor of Islamic studies who will take the responsibility for this vision, who will take the responsibility for guiding some of the leading institutions in this country that seek to prepare such leadership. Responsibility for the curriculum but much more than the curriculum. And that position was given to Professor Abdul Hakim Murad. I want to say a little bit about Professor Abdul Hakim Murad before I ask him to speak, to give us something of that vision, to give us something of how we may achieve what we seek to achieve here, produce institutions, produce curriculums, produce people who will serve us as good leaders into the future. Professor Abdullaki Murad, for many of us, needs no introduction. But just in case there are people here who are not aware of his background, he is the Dean of Cambridge Muslim College, formerly the Director of Studies Theology and Religious Studies at Wolfson College, Cambridge, where he was also the Sheikh Zaid Lecturer in Islamic Studies at Cambridge University. <coughs> he is the founder and inspiration behind the Cambridge Mosque Project. He was educated at Westminster School himself, graduated with a double first from Pembroke College, Cambridge, and thereafter studied at Azhar University as well. 
But more important than that, Professor Abdul Hakim Murad has a unique ability to relate traditional learning and has a rooting in contemporary Muslim communities, both of which he's able to relate to current <coughs> contexts in a way that I've certainly not seen many other Muslims in this country do. And he does that equally well, whether in the local context of Cambridge or the national context or the international context. And I've had the pleasure of listening to him in all three contexts. He is an example of the kind of people that we'd like to see in the future. Somebody who's able to balance what he once said to me, the akal and the knuckle. With this small introduction, I call on Professor Sheikh Abdullahi Murad to address us tonight on how Islamic is Islamic studies, the troubled history of an academic discipline in Europe. Sheikh Abdullahi. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Evening, everyone. Well, I'm grateful, first of all, uh, to the Aziz Foundation for showing a spirit of, shall I say, such a venturesome initiative, as well as very considerable generosity in making this event possible. Quite a bit of the story that I intend to relate this evening may be found uh, somewhat dismal or alarming, but charitable educational enterprises such as theirs do intimate, I feel, in the midst of our current age of crisis when things are falling apart, mere anarchy is unleashed upon the world, the possibility that perhaps, just perhaps, there might be a happy ending to an otherwise rather melancholy and even ominous narrative. I'm going to propose to you this evening a travelogue, a kind of Alan Wicker documentary in which a commentator picks his way through ravaged post-war landscapes to point out the wonders of what used to be and to report perhaps on rebuilding efforts here and there that presage recovery or at least the appearance of a worthwhile surrogate. Islamic civilization, strange and nostalgic category that looks to modern scholarship rather like the Ozymandias of Shelley's poem, from whose shattered visage we infer the power and mood of a great bygone empire. The poet is just one in the army of romantic and perhaps sorry travellers who, particularly on the 18th century grand tour, took delight in the contemplation of ruins. Not a few of them turned east, their eyes contemplating David Roberts' picturesque and evocative vistas of late Ottoman decrepitude, enlivened here and there by a few turbaned figures smoking their chibouks. He depicts them sunk in an oriental repose, peaceably contemplating the mouldering ruins of the Temple of Karnak or the Mosque of Qaitbay. This is the wistful and moralizing tale made ideological again and again in more recent travel literature. It's very salient, for example, in William Dalrymple's Laments for a Dead Mughal Magnificence or Eric Newby's Short Walk in the Hindu Kush. One is pleasantly dazzled by the remaining pleasure domes of an ancient glory, but averts the gaze with irritation from the pickpockets and dacoits who seem to infest them today. So there will be something of what Roloff Benny called the pleasure of ruins in our journey this evening. For the Orientalist and the Muslim nostalgic both seem to stand enthralled by them, their seminars and sermons attempting a kind of seance which communicates with the greatly missed dead. And yet our traveller tonight is not ultimately a tourist. He is no Washington Irving dreaming of the Alhambra of Boabdil. For we mean to accompany a seeker who is on a quest, a pilgrimage even. He is a Majnun seeking only his lost Layla, Farhad crying out for Shirin. I propose to follow the steps of a Talib Alm, a seeker of knowledge engaged in the emblematic Muslim custom of Rihla, an academic expedition seeking the holy grail of the true Isnad and therefore the authentic sage. As he picks his way through the ruins of, as Montgomery Watt put it, the glory that was Islam, what roads can he nowadays tread and what may he still expect to find at his journey's end? 
This seeker follows the Leila and Majnun legend in indicative ways in Nizami's version. Parents argue with him and counsel sanity, family honor, and state propriety, yet the youth insists on his wild and apparently senseless odyssey. Brought up in the wasteland of today's unreal cities, their scolding is shriller by far. Our societies become monetized, instrumentalized, incentivized by performance indicators and career benchmarks among the young. Mental illnesses such as depression rise again and again. Britain too has become a Prozac nation. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Yet our mad rover still leaves his home in Ilford or Small Heath following the rumored <coughs> fragrance of a prosopine who is alive and still fair, but hidden underground during the present winter of the world. Hundreds of our young madmen now roam the earth. British mendicants of this sort are a familiarly exotic sight in Deoband, Cairo, Malaya, and the madrasas of Tuba Dar es Salaam. An inexorable demography, moreover, may be relied upon even to increase their number. Last year's Pew Research report suggested that British Muslims, today 4.1 million, will number 13.4 million by the year 2050. And they are diverse. The Office of National Statistics tells us that 10% of British Muslims are black and almost 8% of them are white. And they are young, and it is the young who catch Majnun's disease and defy tribe and logic to seek what they call sacred knowledge. Let us ignore the fundamentalists among them and the traumatized identity seekers and those thirsting for simple answers to help them cope with the complex world. They are like Salaman in Mullah Jami's tale, Salaman and Absal, who is in love with his nursemaid, who symbolizes the comforts of the ego and the world. The identity-seeking seeker after sacred truth is in fact just pursuing his own lower self, which he has to immolate before he can progress. Here is Fitzgerald translating Jami. And though the better fortune came at last to seal the work, yet every wise man knows such consummation never can be here. Salaman fired the pile, and in the flame that passing him consumed Absal like straw, died his divided self. Nowadays we might talk about cognitive dissonance instead, but the um, pathology is the same. Instead, let us see where the true Majnun might go if he seeks what may be seen as pre-modern Muslim normativity, defined simply as what may be perceived by historians as a rough matrix of recurrent patterns. Has Layla been scarred or slain by modernity? Has it thrown acid in her face? Or is she simply heavily veiled and secluded in some eastern oasis or lost city of brass, a Samarkand imagined and awaiting its discoverer? Hamza Yusuf, we are told, found her in Mauritania, or at least a Mauritania of 30 years ago. But does she still live, though held captive by a foreign empire and by the global reductionism of a totalizing mammon whose agency is everywhere? Shahab Ahmad, for one, seems to doubt this. For him, the mental culture of modern Islam is no longer the true Layla. She is wrinkled, demented, almost or actually dead. After noting furiously the recent demolition of the historic cities of Mecca and Medina, and thus the symbolic erasure of centuries of cumulative culture and institutions, he writes this. The considerable loss of the multidimensional spatiality of revelation is increasingly the leitmotif of modern Islam, and is precisely what makes it difficult for the practitioners of modern Islam to conceptualize pre-modern Islam in a manner that coheres with a human and historical phenomenon that they conceptualize as Islam. So she is gone, and for most of us, forgotten as well. But at least he notes that a spirit of plurality formed a determining element of her subtle charism. She can be helpfully described in a thousand ways. Ahmed argues for something akin to what Marshall Hodgson famously described as the Islamicate, but casts his net even wider. Islam should be interpreted as being everything that Muslims have defined as their relationship to what they imagine Islam to be. Hence it includes the study of Persian kingly wisdom, Plotinus, botany, and borrowed Midrashic tales. 
to impose our own assumption that Islam is ultimately a linear exercise in Quranic commentary is, he says, a characteristic illusion of modern Muslim ideologies and an elderly Orientalism. It is part of the invention of essentialized, dehistoricized religion decried by Cantwell Smith and more recently and thoroughly by Tomoko Masuzawa. Our Majnoon, however, is unlikely to be incentivized by such a fuzzy and all-inclusive definition of what he seeks, a field of signifiers which are determined only by each other and become fully explicable only in faculties of history and sociology. He seeks a narrative with claims to transcendent truth and soteriological power. And here I think one might propose an alternative to Ahmed's flattening and, as it were, de-religionizing of the landscape. <clears throat> what if we were to imagine a vision of the osol and the deep human reasons of those osol, which did in fact enable and even advocate a heterogeneity which might not embrace all the cultural features Ahmed chooses to put in his grab bag of Muslim things, <clears throat> but most of them and particularly the most humanly important. Ahmed seems to assume an eternal tension between the nomocentric boundary-loving ulama and the hard facts of Muslim cultural history. He does show that the fuqaha, like Abu Saud, could acknowledge the paranomian, alternative, and non-juridically detailed routes to access divine charisma and Muslim kingship. But we will need to take a further step for our Majnun, who may love the jurists, as the indispensable custodians of an Islamic essence, those jurists whom Ahmed disdainfully describes as trapped in a confined undertaking. A first example, we've already cited Mullah Jami, recent scholarship on the so-called Timurid Renaissance, of which he was certainly a part, has demonstrated his normativity in a hugely urbane and cosmopolitan Herat sociality, which united the Sultan, Hussein Baikara, Mullah Kashifi, that great belletrist and adorer of the Ahlul Bayt, in a way which ingathered Sunni and Shi'i, and the Chagatai poet Ali Shir Nawai. Mullah Jami, correspondent of Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih and a great hero for Ottoman Grand Muftis, was another Herat polymath who wrote a manual of irrigation techniques, a major grammar text, and the Haft Aurang, the seven thrones of which the Salaman and Absal legend forms one part. He combines the systems of Baha'i Naqshband, Ibn Arabi, Ibn Sina, Taftazani, and Plato. He knows the diversity of the fiqh and the four-part harmony of the madhabs. He writes an epic poem on the death of Alexander the Great and praises the old Persian kings. He is a Renaissance man of Islam, and yet he remains Mullah Jami, staple of the Madrasa syllabus across the Islamicate Republic of Letters. Diversity, hybridity, polyphony, agglomeration were woven inseparably into the fabric of Timurid scholarly culture. Consider another case, this time taken from the Arab universe in the form of a remarkable new study by Konrad Hirschler, who, by studying a medieval Damascene catalogue, has dom demonstrated the cosmopolitanism of the scholars and patrons associated with Middle Eastern libraries. Noting the irenic temper and intellectual curiosity of Syrian jurists in the 13th century, he writes, this tolerance made it possible to accept opposing systems of values and norms without necessarily insisting on the exclusive truth of one's own system. Intellectual life in these societies was thus less characterized by the quest for the one and only truth, but rather by searching for probable and likely answers. Hirschler's point is that the polyphony of the culture was integral to the urbane jurist's understanding of what Islam was. Another instance is a book to be published later this month by Fozia Bora, a former research fellow at the Cambridge Muslim College. Her study of Mamluk historiography demonstrates the willingness of Muslim scholars to transcend sectarian polemic and to seek to offer an accurate and fair-minded account of the views of Muslim others including the Fatimid dynasty, hitherto regnant in Egypt and Syria. Hardly less decisive is the 2011 monograph by Thomas Bauer, entitled The Culture of Ambiguity, which is becoming something of a classic in the field, competing, some already claim, with Edward Said's storied but rather problematic manifesto, Orientalism. Bauer documents the refined and intellectually curious culture of pre-modern fuqaha, who inhabited what he terms an ambiguity-tolerant religious space in which legal and theological options were multiplex 
and exegetes frowned upon zealotry and exclusive closure. For instance, considering medieval Islam's acceptance of different vocalized readings of the Quranic text, Bauer shows how the leading Quran expert of the medieval period, Ibn al-Jazari, who dies in 1429, understood the Quran's textual variations, the qira'at, as a divine gift. He then contrasts this with a modern jurist, Ibn Uthaymin, who dies in 2001, who attempted to advocate for a single authorized version of the text. Similarly, he explores the Quranic commentary of al-Mawardi, who dies in 1058, who accepted that the Quranic text could be interpreted in many diverse ways and compares this irenic approach with the same Ibn Uthaymin's insistence that only one meaning can ever be correct. The shift from an ambiguity-tolerant Islam to an ambiguity-intolerant alternative synchronized with the impact of modernity, as Muslims sought to combat anomie and scientific challenges with a simplified and unified truth. He dates the transformation just to the last century and a half, although he acknowledges that classical Islamic understanding still prevail among the remaining traditional scholars. Indeed, that claim is almost a tautology. In this world of polysemy, enabled or even enforced by a God who had bestowed complex scriptures, which often seemed difficult to interpret, Muslim intellectuals wondered whether all possible opinions, if reasonably and sincerely held, might somehow be acceptable to heaven. One tendency, called the mukhatta'a, proposed that only one interpretation was in fact correct. Al-haqqu fil wahid, they held to be a self-evident truth. Yet for the majority, this view came to be discarded in favor of the conclusion of another group, styled the Musawwiba, who believed that every qualified jurist's conclusions were in some sense correct and approved by God. Suhaira Siddiqui, who has studied at the Cambridge Muslim College, has written well on this. Perhaps this served to make a virtue out of a necessity, but it deeply colored pre-modern Islam's understanding of societal and legal norms and the divine purposes towards humanity, which was to flourish in diversity and ongoing debate. In many ways, it sat well with other ubiquitous tendencies in the culture, such as the so-called command ethics of Asharism, which held that moral truths are not magically intrinsic in the material world, but are determined by divine speech, which does, of course, manifest polysemy. Speech permits ambiguity where matter cannot. It also cohabits with Sufi inwardness, which in ways often convergent with Asharite apophaticism, frequently accepted the inevitability of diversity in strategies of, design, of describing the spiritual path and the design of liturgies. A typical Sufi poem ran, our expressions are diverse, but your beauty is one. And all these words point to that same beauty. So our Majnun, if he seeks normativity, ought to seek out this learned culture which tolerates and even rejoices in diversity. Truth is to be known, but its pathways and expressions are likely to be many. He or she, for women today, increasingly attempt this errantry, adding to the confusion of parents, must seek the face of the thousand aspects. Bearing this in mind, we keep company with our traveller to pick our way through the wrecked landscape of modern madrasa <coughs> education. In some places, favoured until five years ago by dozens of British students, the madrasas themselves are ruined in a literal way. Dozens of UK tullab will fondly remember the Ma'had al-Fatih in Damascus. Now its scholars form a diasporic community and many are unlikely to see their city and their houses again. In Iraq, the Imam Azam University once maintained 5,000 students at its Qatari-built sub-campus in Mosul. In 2013, the Nawaqidiyah drove in, demanded the keys, and gave the scholars 24 hours to leave. They and their students tried to continue in Erbil, over the front line in Iraqi Kurdistan. When they visited the trenches, not far away, in scenes perhaps a little redolent of the First World War, they could hear the Maghrib prayers being recited on both sides. Today coincides with the Mawlid, whose historically evolved commemoration began centuries ago in the city of Mosul. But in that city this evening, those who celebrate it huddle secretly in houses, for the zealot Mukhatta'a, armed with knives, still prowl the streets after dark, looking for infractions. 
Most of Yemen, too, is now imploding in fitna, civil strife, and invasion. Libya, where some Westerners trained, is now fought over by a remarkable 93 factions, surely one of the most complex and fissiparous civil wars in human history. So four major Arab countries are now academically, as well as economically, politically, and spiritually shattered. But a further disincentive is hard to mistake, not only in the Arab world, but across the Darul Islam, and this we might call curricular heteronomy. Well, El Halak has reminded us of the structural gulf which must separate Sharia from traditional sultanic power. The jurists are from communities. They are not agents of the ruler. There is no Caesar or papism. This is the judge's law, Cardis Gericht, which so disgusted Weber. And with the madrasas, it is likewise. Occasional sultanic waqf giving might endow madrasas promoting a particular theology regarded as politically expedient. Nizam al-Mulk is the oft-cited example. Orhan Ghazi's first madrasa in Iznik might be another. But no amount of royal fiat could readily dictate what was taught. Hence the historic role of the madrasa as a bastion of the people's culture and values against the depredations of power. In the madrasa, the Muslim moral self was cultivated to speak freely in the judge's chair or the mosque pulpit. The scholars and their scholarship comprised society's voice, and the sultan could only listen and perhaps tremble. In Muslim society, the vox dei was ventriloquized by the vox populi, but the sultan's voice remained just another Muslim voice. Halak's work intends to show the structural incompatibility of Sharia with the Westphalian order and the nation state, and his argument is persuasive but his logic may readily be extended to show that the corporatist post-colonial polities of the Muslim world have also subverted the historic Sunni insistence on what we might call academic freedom from state intervention. Faced with the colonial French manipulation of religious leaders, what the Pentagon nowadays calls religion building, Ahmad al-Bamba had cried, do not kneel before the rulers, and famously laid his pen next to a French cannon in Saint Louis writing his great qasida, Ya al bisharati to indicate his confidence in God's support for independent and unbowed scholars who could speak truth to power and who thought that God's religion ought to side with the helpless. His terrible exile in Gabon, which followed, was a 19th century reprise of a very long tradition of scholarly resistance, a tale which had seen Malik ibn Anas flogged by one Abbasid commander of the faithful who had unsuccessfully instructed him to change his fatwa on involuntary divorce. State actors across the modern Muslim world now actively seek agency in fatwa production and madrasa curricula, often clutching the fig leaf of counter-radicalization. So in 2010, King Abdullah issued a decree giving the Saudi Council of Senior Scholars a legal monopoly over fatwa making in his realm. Independent scholarship there is all but impossible under the basilisk gaze of this compliant council. Salman al awda was arrested in September 2017 for upbraiding this trahison des clercs. Others have followed into exile or the gulag. The sermons of a Caesar of Papist clerisy insist that the state's boycott of Qatar, for instance, is Islamically mandated. The rest is silence. Mosque assembly and the freedom to preach are also increasingly circumscribed. The 2016 attempt by Egypt's military rulers to impose a single Friday sermon had to be rowed back in the face of popular and Azharite outrage, but the effort may be repeated. In Morocco, state control of religious curricula is now ubiquitous, with imam training centralized in the vast Muhammad VI Institute in Rabat, whose curriculum is shaped by civil servants. Hence, all imams are expected to be Maliki, Ashari, and Sufi in orientation, as this is thought to support the Islam Shabi, the popular religion which has historically been averse to insurrection. It is the state, too, which funds the rebuilding of Morocco's often derelict Sufi Zawiyas and notably supports the Bouchishi order with its estimated two million members. Abdel Ilah Bou Asriya has written extensively on this in a recent study. Moroccan spiritual dirigism by the national elite, the Mahzan, is quite recent. 
under Hassan II, there had been an acceptance that Islam Shabi would continue to decay and be replaced by a kind of hygienic literalism coming from the Gulf. In his remarkable article, The Reshaping of Moroccan National Identity, Michael Ben Saadoun writes this. Hassan II encouraged the penetration of Wahhabism in mosques and schools to strengthen the religious legitimacy of the monarchy. The sociologist Muhammad al-Ayadi analyzed the effects of this policy on Moroccan young men. What if the thoughts of our lovelorn wanderer turn to distant Bangladesh, perhaps the land of his ancestors? There has been in that country since 1979 a Madrasa Education Board, a quango which has uh, augmented the essentially Deobandi curriculum of the earlier madrasas with what it calls modern subjects, generating a two-track epistemology in which traditional topoi are largely undisturbed with little conceptual interaction with new subject areas such as science and Bangladesh studies. State surgery aims at excision and addition rather than subtle metabolic adjustments which might allow the new transplants to take. Last year, the government appointed a committee to review their fiqh textbooks and removed the chapter on jihad, despite the protests of Alia Madrasa teachers that it was necessary for students to be able to differentiate classical normative teachings on jihad from modern militancy. In a further intervention, the Awami League government is moving to take independent non alia madrasas, the so-called Qaumi madrasas, under some form of centralized ideological oversight. A further government commission is offering to accredit madrasa degrees in exchange for the acceptance of a new state curriculum of some kind. The Qaumi madrasas, which currently educate an estimated 1.4 million students, follow a darsin Nizami syllabus which culminates for a few in the Dawra Hadith. This is now to be recognized as a master's degree. Since this is an entirely traditional memorization-based course, nakli, not akli, in the traditional parlance, very considerable pedagogic and philosophical emendation will surely be required. The aim, transparently, is to reduce and perhaps ultimately eliminate the fully independent heritage of madrasa learning. If students want to be employable, they must study an approved curriculum. There is a risk that ultimately the state will increasingly function as the mujtahid, picking the texts and determining right religion. The process is happening also in Singapore. Last year, again, the Singapore government formally established an Asatiza Recognition Board, which issues permits to preachers and religious teachers and disciplines or retires those whose messages are deemed unacceptable or who teach without authorization. Such a permit is required for teaching Islam even to one other person, unless it be a family member. Overseas speakers, if their subject is Islam, must apply for a separate permit, supplying the text or at least the substance of their lecture in advance. Through such processes, the madrasa world is mutating. It continues its historic function in mediating between power and parishes, but increasingly represents the former to the latter, not vice versa. Recurrent and thus normative historic structures are inverted and religious authority becomes monopolized or at least subaltern to the corporate state. If pre-modern Islam was never theocratic, insofar as the structures of state and religious knowledge were carefully segregated, but was not secular either, an ironic entailment of this third world etatism is a type of elision of sacred and profane authority and knowledge production. The culture of ambiguity is abolished in favor of homogenized religious narratives deemed favorable to regime survival. Our Western pilgrim will not find his holy grail in such establishments. His government may even tacitly approve the regulation of the colleges and the censorship of the learned, thinking that this forms part of the emerging global security architecture. 27 French imams are now being taught at the Muhammad VI Academy, with many more to follow. Their Islam, their reception of revelation through the scholarly debates and conscience of centuries, may turn out to be a composite engineered product influenced by the often <coughs> clumsy simplifications and reflexes of governments acting in self-defense. Even if students are persuaded that such a product is authentic, it is likely to incorporate inconsistent manipulations and asymmetries which cannot settle comfortably as the grounds of a coherent and credible theology. 
if regime survival, rather than love of God and the believers, sways exegetic choices and influences qiyas, istihsan, maslaha, and orf, then fiqh, as classically understood, has come to an end. And countries with singular religious authorities directed by the ruler, which penalize independent sheikhs who teach in the traditional way, have cut their sanad, their chain of transmission, with all antecedent Muslim learning. This process may one day be so universal that students will no longer even be able to guess how Islamic pedagogy always used to be. This applies a fortiori to the Saudi universities, which historically have attracted dozens of British seekers. The Saudis are a special and controversial case. And at this point, before I proceed, I believe that we need to take a break at this halfway point on our voyage in order to interrogate some of our familiar lexis. I believe that much current literature and almost all recent journalism deploys taxonomies which obfuscate and elide. Let me briefly assess a few of these misnomers so familiar in the media to explain why I will not be using them in the rest of this presentation. Firstly, the term Islamism, almost ubiquitous, seems to denote an ideology which commends the imposition of Islamic legal norms by the state. This seems to be the assumption of the contributors to, for instance, the journal Current Trends in Islamist Ideology, published by the right-wing Hudson Institute. And yet Morocco, whose monarch bears the caliphal title Commander of the Faithful, and which states that it applies a variant of Sharia through the Mudawwana Code, is not described as Islamist by most Western discussants, particularly those special pleaders who typically infest the so-called security industry. Neither, even more strikingly, is Saudi Arabia. Yet Turkey, according to the regnant discourse, is in the grip of a kind of soft Islamism, despite the fact that President Erdogan has not enacted a single Sharia law. Clearly, something very curious is at work in late modernity's semantic hall of mirrors. One can only presume that the term Islamist is deployed as a thin description, pejoratively to indicate an agent of some policy associated with believing Muslims which is uncongenial to the West. Hence, it seems evident that the term cannot be used academically unless it is very carefully and probably unconventionally defined. Still more, still more paradoxical is the category of the jihadist or the jihadi used throughout the scholarship by Gilles Kepel, Bernard Haeckel, and the rest for a terrorist claiming Muslim motivation. This and a fortiori, the use of jihad as a synonym for Islamist terror, confounds Muslim discourse, which classically would deploy the term hiraba, reserving jihad for very different military mechanisms, incorporating strict jus in bello rules for civilian protection and the rejection of spectacular revenge killings. I propose, furthermore, at least a partial retirement of the word takfiri. After all, takfir, the acceptance that some people are outside the fold of Islam, is a possible procedure in every school of classical Islam. Imam al-Ghazali, famously, attributes disbelief to some Hellenized Muslim philosophers for their apparent refusal of the idea that God knows particulars and will resurrect humanity for judgment. The term takfiri then surely joins the list of terms which confuse rather than elucidate and describe. But because I cannot ignore Saudi educational options, my real focus in this subsection on the language we use will be, the words, will be on the words Wahhabi and Salafi. Both are conventional, conventional in the scholarly literature. For example, we have David Dean Commons's book, The Wahhabi Mission, and Royal Maija's text, Global Salafism, Islam's New Religious Movement, which both appeared in 2009. We also have the very influential article by Quentin Viktorovics, Anatomy of the Salafi Movement, published in Studies in Conflict and Terrorism in 2006. Now, it is clear that the adjective, of wah adjective Wahhabi can, in fact, have an academic application, simply to denote movements which very deliberately trace their inspiration back to the hermeneutics of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, in the way that Shafi'is, for instance, attribute themselves to Imam al-Shafi'i, albeit in divergent ways. But the word Salafi, originating from soi-disant Salafis themselves, also begs a rather central question, since it implies that Sunnis who are not Salafis are not followers of the Salaf, the earliest Muslim generations. 
Yet any investigation of the methodological manuals of Hanbali, Hanafi, Maliki, and Shafi'i jurisprudence will reveal that all believe in the primacy of the law and doctrine of the earliest Muslims, wherever this can be reliably established. After all, does not the Azharite creed of Ibrahim al-Laqani contain the line, فَكُلُّ خَيْرٍ فِي اتِّبَاعِ مَنْ سَلَفْ وَكُلُّ شَرٍ فِي ابْتِدَاعِ مَنْ خَلَفْ All good is to be found in following the early believers. All evil lies in the innovations of latecomers. And yet, as Aaron Spivak has recently reminded us, Laqani was Ashari, Maliki, Sufi. And all these are monikers disparaged by groups nowadays identified with Salafiya. All Sunnis are, correctly speaking, Salafis, insofar as the primacy of the methods of the Salaf are undisputed. There may possibly be true and false Salafis, but all are Salafis nonetheless, their, divers their diversity reflecting the diversity of the Salaf themselves. Western accounts have very often failed to note this. Moreover, Salafis in the conventional sense, despite so much of the literature, are not adherents of a single method or approach. Fundamentalism is physiparous. William Shepherd has documented this admirably, showing that interpretations of the way of the early faithful are legion. Early Islam was intensely diverse and followed no single heuristic. Miklos Murani and Omar Abdullah have shown this decisively by looking at the most ancient Sharia manuscripts. So I'll propose now we have broached the subject of Saudi colleges to avoid the vague and often pejorative Salafi label and to home in on two rival tendencies, perhaps extremes, within that movement, the Madkhali and the Nawaqidi. The Madkhalis are approximately the group identified by Quentin Wiktorovics as purist Salafis, a term which once again seems ambiguous given that everyone, mutatis mutandis, claims to follow a pure teaching. They are clearly apolitical and urge obedience to established political authority. The Nawaqidiyya, however, are the revolutionaries. Their focus is on the book Nawaqid al-Islam of Ibn Abdul Wahhab, a work which was famously distributed by Daesh following their capture of Mosul. This short tract lists ten ways in which Muslims cease to be Muslims and is a point of reference for militants everywhere. For instance, Abu Omar al-Baghdadi in his book Hadihi Aqidatuna wa Manhajuna, which is a Daesh instruction manual, focuses preeminently on the Nawaqid's teachings. So too does Turki bin Ali, the leading mufti of Daesh, who was trained in Saudi Arabia and emphasized the centrality of the Nawaqid as a kind of manifesto for modern Islam. Uh, British Majnoon, who visits Saudi campuses and makes inquiries at the admissions office, will already be aware of this tension. The Saudi agencies tread a narrow bridge over the current fundamentalist inferno. One scholar calls them arsonists and firefighters, and during the Daesh crisis, Saudi scholars such as Asharif al Auni and Adil Kalbani pointed out the genetic links between the Saudi theology and that of Daesh. After all, did not Daesh use Saudi textbooks in their schools? The Saudi authorities, even before the Crown Prince's current shift to an undefined moderate Islam, have been editing the curricula in a generally madkhali direction. While this is a polemical and exclusionary reading of Islam, it is certainly not inclined to terrorism, and Muslims and others should be clear about this. And yet a twofold problem for British seekers remains. Madkhalism is a hard version of Mukhati'a Islam, ambiguity intolerant, disinclined to affirm diversity. And the Mukhati'a, we have suggested, quite often attract the suitors of Absal, not of Layla. Secondly, there is the poorly studied phenomenon of conversion from Madkhalism to the Nawaqidiyya. A recent study by Michael Waldemariam has shown how apolitical Saudi-backed schools in Somalia in the early 1990s, known as the Ittihad schools, mutated very suddenly into nurseries for the movement that became known as Shabab. Similarly, Boko Haram founder Muhammad Yusuf began his preaching in Maiduguri with the madkhalism he had acquired during his studies at Medina University, but converted to a Nawaqadi interpretation. Other cases could be cited, but my purpose in this parenthesis has been to show just two things. Firstly, that not all so-called Wahhabism is politically extreme. And secondly, that our seeker after pre-modern Muslim authenticity, after inspecting the Saudi campuses, is rather likely to look elsewhere. 
One evident elsewhere is, of course, Western universities, some of which maintain, in various forms, programs in what is called Islamic studies. As instability grows in the Middle East and curricula are subject to regime encroachment, it is likely that our Majnun will consider this option more seriously than he might have done 20 years ago. It entails, for a Western Muslim, a kind of hijra within, not to faraway madrasas in a ruined Darul Islam, but to a different habitat where freedoms are more actual and, in fact, claim to be zealously guarded. Remember the poem of Abdullah ibn al-Harith, given refuge from Quraysh in Ethiopia. Each of God's servants is today pressed hard in Mecca's veil, defeated, subject to tribulation. We have found God's earth to be wide, saving us from humiliation, shame and abasement. So could it be, in a rather strange way, that a hijra from rather than to the Darul Islam and its wrecked institutions is now to be advised? Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Bangladesh and elsewhere are, after all, locked into what Seamus Heaney, musing on Northern Irishness, called the tight gag of place. Their particularities are intolerably parochial. Controversial views are suffocated by local culture as well as by regimes. What can we say about Islamic studies in the modern Western Academy? And here we use the adjective Western in the non-geographic sense. For one can take nowadays many courses in Islam at, for instance, the Abu Zabi campus of New York University, where every student has to take at least one Islamic studies module. This is rather a distinguished program, it seems, where the ambiguity tolerance of pre-modern Islam is recognized. Hence, one can study texts by Ibn Arabi, Rumi, Baydawi, Razi, and other medieval thinkers typically shut out by fundamentalists and the diversity averse. The lecturers are mainly non-Muslim Americans, and the approach is rooted in Islamic studies as presented in American area studies departments, a policy which seems generally favored in the Gulf region. One can take modules usually ignored by madrasa curricula, such as Islam's understanding of disability, for instance, or Islamic art and architecture. Surely this is an attractive alternative. In the Abu Zabi syllabus, one sees how modern approaches to the great theodrama of Islamic civilization in its diachronic and synchronic heterogeneity again threaten the viability of the adjectives Muslim and Islamic themselves. Anthropologists such as Clifford Gert delight in interrogating these markers as relics of an older theological essentialism and propose that even Hodgson's Islamicate, which we referred to earlier, must be dissected into an endlessly variegated field of moods and motivations. In the academy, in the academy while Orientalist departments sometimes seek to conserve the study of a medieval canon, historically Abbasid in its focus, as the most proper concern of Islamicists, we note the bewildering and revealing proliferation of the study of aspects of the Islamicate in an increasing range of arts faculties, including philosophy, theology, history of science, sociology, politics, and even English history. It's not clear whether the idea of Islamic studies can adequately survive the realization that most Muslims live east of Karachi and that post-Abbasid intellectual life is more interesting than Orientalists like Krauss, Stern ever imagined. Leila here doesn't really exist at all, or like the Seymour of Attar's Conference of the Birds, she is in fact found within, a self which projects the object of its quest, Islam, outside itself into the world of indefinitely multiple significations. Still, Islamic studies departments do tend to make claims for some form of coherence in their discipline. And for Muslim seekers, one difficult axiom of this has been that Orientalism, its roots deep in philology, wissenschaftly her calling par excellence, has always insisted on its outsider status. It's not Muslim. With Richard Rorty's skyhooks, it swings up above the personal commitments of engagé insiders and surveys Islam from the Olympian detachment of a seminar room. Aaron Hughes still campaigns to maintain the purity of this ideology. 
Humboldtian campuses, including the new American ones in the Muslim world, can thus appear to present a magisterial exegesis on behalf of an Enlightenment imperium. And this is exacerbated by the refusal to allow theology a context in such colleges. In the Emirates, a land of insiders, outsider discourse is to monopolize pedagogy, at least in these traditionalist enclaves of Occidental reason. Christian theologians are unimpressed by this kind of positivist totalism. Listen, for instance, to the critique of Mike Higton in his book, A Theology of Higher Education. For Higton, assailing the secular positivistic assumptions of the academy, the university that they envisage does not actually allow each citizen to speak on his own behalf if he is not allowed to speak as the member of the particular positive religious and secular traditions that have shaped him. The very stricture that the romantic theorists erect in order to preserve free sociality is one that makes it impossible. And yet, despite this very paradoxical rule, the Western Academy has typically internalized a kind of Averroes dual truth on the nature of religious claims. There are spaces where views from somewhere are entertained. Orientalism doggedly sticks with a Kantian and Berlin model, but in America and Europe, uh, if not in branch campuses in the Gulf, there also tend to be faculties of theology or of divinity, which in complex ways permit religious traditions not just to be seen, but to be heard. These faculties are, for historic reasons, dominated by Christian paradigms, and the advocacy or exploration of Muslim truths as truths is still seldom <coughs> attempted within their walls. But surely here we see an opportunity not some kind of sally port for unscholarly fideism, but an invigorating broadening of the episteme. And this possibility of a Muslim theology in modern universities benefiting from a real culture of academic freedom seems reinforced by the decline of the old Humboldtian ideology as it withers under the impact of various styles of deconstruction and social change. Much recent philosophy is an accessory to the progressive interrogation or abolition of the discipline of Islamic studies as an objective exercise in historiography by the detached Western self. There are many Deleuzeans who insist on challenging the Enlightenment assurance about any truth as bearing fixity and a relationship to public reason. For this, Deleuze would have us think, is always a region carved out of the irrational. Even in the natural sciences, facts are always attributable to those who advocate them. The truths to which Islamic or any other studies incline, however, forensically supported by apparatus and annotations of the various kinds required in the guild, are only cultural facts. And this perhaps accounts for the flux of thesis and antithesis in intellectual fashions and ideas, for instance, about the origins of Islam. Our findings inhabit a metaphysical bubble floating in the spume of principial chaos, where medieval and also enlightenment universities of the Humboldtian type assumed an orderly physical creation which philosophy should mirror and match. The quantum revolution seems to be the ontological ground of the modern humanities, where movements are never decisive and everything oscillates. The wider Western culture, which is the academy's life support system, also seems to underpin this. We no longer look to humanities departments for guidance towards truth. And certainly Muslim students who think that joining academic Islamic studies will supply membership of a mandarinate which advises state and society will very quickly be disabused. Recall this sobering fact. The US government's Middle East portfolio has been handed to Jared Kushner, a 37-year-old estate agent who has never even been a civil servant. Recent Western politics has probably been more influenced by Cambridge Analytica than by the University of Cambridge. There is much on this and more in Zainab Tufic's excellent book, Twitter and Tear Gas. Tom Nichols' book, The Death of Expertise, is also sobering and very timely. It's not only fundamentalists, but just about everyone now who lives in knowledge silos. And this is the social context for the postmodern crumbling of the brave Kantian assurances about universal autonomous reason and the possibility of truth being discerned through the weaving together of the discoveries of a community of free minds. Western universities, in the eyes of many writers, are ruined hardly less than the madrasas. But there is potential here useful energies generated by the force of the implosion, we find that theology often claims to be taking a second wind. 
Having discussed the internal contradictions of the Kantian model, Higton then documents what he sees as the virtual collapse of the Enlightenment vision of a university as a coherent community of seekers after public truth. The pursuit of truth has recently been set at the margins, either due to the monetizing of the academy or because of hyper-specialization and weak interdisciplinarity, or because of a general postmodern culture in which the pursuit of truth is dismissed as a fool's errand. For Higton, fragmented expertise is the coin of such a university, not truth. Any strong version of a commitment to truth, strong enough, that is, to guide the university past the lure of problematic funding sources, to drive it beyond fragmentation, to offset the temptations of the purely pragmatic and utilitarian, turns out to flounder when removed from the water of robust conceptions of the human good, and so to be among those things bound eventually to become extinct in the realm of attenuated public reason. Stanley Hauerwas has further pursued this discussion of the failure of the Humboldtian Academy to secure, the, to secure the pursuit of public truths on the basis of a thesis that universities require a symbiosis with what Alastair MacIntyre calls a learned public. Universities pursue truth in order to train students in virtuous service to society, we are told. Kant's assumption was that this wider society would naturally exhibit a care for truth, a common coin in his world. In the 21st century, however, this common coin has been debased or abolished in favour of other forms of credit. For Rowan Williams, speaking of the British case, it isn't clear what the university's paymasters think the university is there for. They only know that they want it to give value for money. For Hauerwas, a university able to resist the mystifications legitimated by the abstractions of our social order will depend on a people shaped by fundamental practices necessary for truthful speech. For him, and also for Higton, the radical decay of a general public sense of what truth might be underlines the legitimacy and even the importance of a renewed theological project within the academy. Zygmunt Bauman's culture of liquid modernity cannot supply the external measures of the public good which the Enlightenment academic schema presumes. For Hauerwas, the church contributes by developing a people capable of bearing the burden of honour and truthfulness, a people without which the university, as I conceive its task, cannot exist. Higton further accepts that such a blood transfusion into a truth-starved, instrumentalised modern academy cannot be a purely Christian perquisite, Thinkers of all traditions must offer their own capacities for the production of virtue and of the incentive to seek truth. The fact that we are startled or inclined to cynicism when told that the modern Western university began as a project for the seeking of public truth reminds us how far we have traveled from that ideal. In the context of Islamic studies, however, it should be evident that the remnants of the Wissenschaft ideologie, which demands that I participate only as myself, and not as, for example, as a Marxist or a Christian or an Ashari, are no longer sufficient to suffocate the plurality of a modern Islamic studies program or to limit its future horizons. We should look then to the promotion of Islamic studies within divinity schools, not as a replacement or rival to the older Oriental studies, but as a necessary and very contemporary opening up of the epistemic horizon. And in various complex ways, this is already in progress, the significance of the work of Yahi Michaud, for instance, at Hartford Seminary, who successfully combines an unmistakable voice from somewhere with trenchant academic rigor is one case in point. Universities such as Edinburgh, Brandeis, and Yale also provide space for Muslim theologians. The step has been taken. Muslim intellectuality in the Western Academy is already a salient and influential fact. Thinkers like Sherman Jackson, for instance, enjoy a wide following in the Islamic world. Western universities are almost certainly better habitats for research and creative thinking than Eastern institutions. Yet, our Talib Alim is still seeking an undergraduate theological and juridical training, and few Western universities can yet accommodate that. Hence, the urgent need for carefully hybridized spaces which can benefit from academic freedom and contemporary research methods while still offering an education which recognizes the curricular and vocational needs of insider believing students. One of these, it seems, is the Faculty of Islamic Studies on the Education City campus in Qatar. 
Another is the Ibn Khaldun University in Istanbul. Neither seek to replicate either a siloed madrasa thought world or a faculty of oriental studies. The Cambridge Muslim College and Ibrahim College also try to invigorate Muslim scholarship by standing at the Majma al-Bahrain, the isthmus between the two universes of discourse. One result is necessarily the return of a culture of diversity as intrinsic to the authentic and uncompromising Muslim pursuit of truth. So is this, finally, journey's end? Is our tale of woe to have a happy ending after all? That remains, I think, only in prospect, not in fact, for these tender new shoots visibly rising from the ashes left by fundamentalist or modernist forest fires need careful nurturing. The zeitgeist lost in polarized absolutes will not support them. They must remain free of political interference. But however tentative may be their efforts, they stand on the horizon, uh, not as cities of brass certainly, but as refugees for a few and paradigms of something demonstrably achievable. Whether their students have found their beloved as they imagined her to be is for posterity to judge, but meeting them and asking them a few questions may be a not unreliable guide. <laughs>